In the 1600s, German dog breeders selectively bred a lineage of hounds into an elongated type which they hoped would be able to chase badgers into their own burrow. What they got was a wiener dog. The Pekingese is another much more ridiculous looking breed. This googly-eyed yapping Pez dispenser is a subset of the toy group. It is said to have begun with a birth defect which looked to the Empress Tu Shi like an oriental depiction of a lion. So she bred that dog with normal toy dogs until she got more puppies that shared the same trait and eventually established that breed and also the Shih Tzu. Some breeds are new and frequently vary. Others haven't changed in thousands of years. One of these, the Chow Chow, is another Chinese dog possibly ancestral to the Pekingese, which has been genetically identified as one of the most ancient breeds, one of four original lineages now proven to have been derived from Asiatic wolves. So anyone asking, if we came from monkeys, why do we still have monkeys, might just as well say, if dogs came from wolves, then why are there still wolves? The principle is the same in either case. We've only recently realized how selective breeding can produce specific results. Artificial selection often imposes different pressures than natural selection would, but both methods otherwise evoke the same mechanism in that they select from the naturally emerging variety, drawing and discarding from each hand that is dealt, so that evolution at every level is nothing more than population genetics. I thought that everybody knew enough about evolution to understand at least this much, but it seems that some people are unable and or unwilling to understand even the simplest lessons. You just, you know, God gave us six senses. Mm -hmm. The sixth sense is common sense, and that's what the atheist and the evolutionists lack. You've just got to think for a moment. Let's pretend I'm a believer in evolution for a moment. There's a big bang, life form begins, and over millions of years, a dog evolves. Mm -hmm. It's the first dog. He's got a tail, legs, teeth, eyes, and it's good that he's got eyes because he needs to look for a female. He's been blind for millions of years, but now he can see. Right. He's got to find a female. She's got to be evolved at the right place, the right time, with the right reproductive organs, and a desire to mate. Mm -hmm. Because without a female, he's a dead dog. <laughs> there's, no, there's no species. You've got yeah. to have a female. Yeah. And you've got to relate this to not only dogs, but giraffes, elephants, horses, cats, cows, mice, mm. uh, birds, fish. Everything has to have a female evolve at the right place, at the right time, right reproductive organs, and a desire to mate. Is that the way Darwin described it, Ray? Is that the way any evolutionary scientist ever described it? Is there any doubt whether Ray Comfort knows for certain that everything he says is a lie? I would have thought that no one could possibly be stupid enough to believe any of Ray's guano, but then I realized who he's talking to. So let's imagine that first German dachshund. Did it start out as some amorphous mass of meat that lived for millions of years until it suddenly grew a tail, legs, teeth, and eyes? Why then would all male dogs, like the males of every mammalian species, have nipples? What the world's leading minds have all figured out, and this virtually illiterate intellectual dropout has to overlook, is that the female is the foundation of the species, not the male. That's one of the many things Western monotheism got completely backwards. Obviously, deriving dachshunds from hounds is essentially the same process of multi-generational population mechanics as deriving hounds from wolves, and Ray Comfort already knows that. At first, you might think he's really amazingly imbecilic, but he isn't really that stupid. He has a large house near the beach in Southern California with plenty of servants and lackeys, and he has lots of other people's money to spend, and he never had to do anything to earn or deserve any of it. His supporters are stupid, certainly all of them idiots in the extreme, because they would rather reinforce a detrimental delusion than allow themselves to understand an obvious and useful reality. On some level, it seems they'd have to know they're paying Ray to lie to them. Whether they realize that or not, they'd still have to be morons just to give this man their money. But Comfort himself isn't that dumb. There's another word for what he is, and it's something worse than someone who simply doesn't know any better. Now, if you're as blatantly dishonest as this asshole, or if you're anywhere near as idiotic or insane as this special Olympian super bigot, then I can't help you and neither will Jesus. But if your brain still works, if reliable information and accurate knowledge still have some value to you, then you never listen to either of these defective feces anyway. But you might be interested in the real story about the evolutionary origin of dogs.
The American Kennel Club officially recognizes hundreds of wildly diverse breeds within a half dozen or so arbitrarily assigned groups, all under one species name, Canis lupus familiaris, because of their derivation from wolves. But not all dogs descend from wolves. The African wild dogs, which we now refer to as Lacan pictus, ought to be called Canis lacan if we were to adhere to phylogenetic rules consistently. Because these dogs are a different species of the same genus. Creationists will doubtless say, oh, but they're the same kind, but no, not quite. There's a lot more to the canine clan than most people are aware of. Apart from the several types of wolves, coyotes, jackals, and other lupine-looking things, we also have several other canines that are definitely dogs, but did not descend from wolves, and are each distinctly different species than the ones we keep as house pets. Today's lesson in phylogeny is how cladograms are constructed, and we're going to focus on the order carnivora, which is represented in this collection of skulls. Dogs of all types have shown that morphology alone can sometimes fail us because there is often more diversity within a species than between species. For example, some of these skulls are from different genera, or different families, but the most diverse skulls in this collection are all from the same species. That makes it a bit difficult to classify them by their physical traits alone. So instead we turn to their genome. By evaluating a large sample of DNA of different closely related species, it is possible to estimate monophyletic emergence and even mutation rates over time to determine when the divergence occurs. Domestic dogs emerged from wolves within the last 15,000 years or so after wolves and coyotes diverged. But as you can see, the African lycan is far removed from any domestic dog. Breeders are able to produce change only within boundaries. Even those dogs are all members of a single biological species, which are chemically interfertile. No, they're not. Thus far, no one has been able to hybridize a lichen with any domestic pooch. The more distantly related they are, the more improbable that is, and these have grown too far apart from other canines. All modern dogs share a common ancestry with a more generalized basal karyotypic form which we call foxes. In the 10 million years or so since, foxes have produced their own weird convergent varieties like the raccoon dog and the bush dog. And, well, this is what happens when you try to make a wolf out of a fox. But of course, these are only the canids we still have around today. The fossil record shows us many more, and I'm not just talking about extinct forms of wolves. The Borophagines were an ancient genus of terrifying wargs from the Miocene, a sister clade of Cananae named for their massive carnassals, which enabled them to bite through bone the way we would bite through carrots. This group included some of the largest dogs that ever lived, like the appropriately named Episcyon. At 37 inches high and 224 pounds, this monster dog was as big as an English mastiff. The only larger dog was Aileron taxoides, some of whom could have been as big as tigers. Of course, not all canoids were big, and not all of them were even dogs, either. Tracing their lineage even further, we find that the first dogs appear in the Eocene, but the earliest canoids looked less like dogs and more like a composite of other caniforms. Hesperocyon, for example, the earliest known canid, obviously hasn't yet adapted the high-speed endurance running which made later dogs the super predators that they are. Modern canids can run so far and so fast with less energy expended because they're digigrade, running on their toes to provide a little extra spring. That's why their legs are shaped that way, and why their thumbs have been reduced to vestigial dew claws. But Hesperocyon is a transitional form between sprinting on its toes and plodding on its whole foot like bears do. This was obviously a slow transition, as there were some bears caught in that transition too. This also illustrates how closely related dogs and bears once were. We don't have DNA for any of these extinct forms, so we can't test morphologically constructed trees like this against the genome, but we do have bear DNA, and that confirms that they are related to modern dogs, and so are seals and walruses, although only the fossil record can show us how. So going back even further, we find a chronological and morphological precedent to Hesperocyon Sinodictus, a precanid and an undifferentiated dog bear, meaning that it has traits of both dogs and bears and is basal to both. In fact, if you trace the apparent evolution of bears the way we've just done with dogs, you'll come to this same animal. Here's where the fossil record reveals another whole line of ancient carnivores which most people know nothing about, Amphicyonids, also known as bear dogs. Most of these would have looked more like wolverines than either bears or dogs. 
Xenodictus was rendered in CGI for the BBC production of Walking with Prehistoric Beasts, but the artists made a critical error. They made them digigrade like dogs, but bear dogs were plantigrade like bears and weasels, seals, and all other caniforms. In fact, the largest of this group, Amphicyon, might have looked very much like a bear with a long tail. As a child, I knew that bears were related to dogs and what that meant. And I remember going to Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles, where we were told about the constellations Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, both of which are, curiously, bears with long tails. No one could explain why they were rendered that way, so I remember wondering if there were still some long-tailed bears around when the ancient Greeks were making up what they thought the constellations looked like. Smaller, more primitive amphicyonids had the most generalized karyotypic shape still seen among caniforms. Every family within that suborder begins with a similar-looking critter. Long tail, plantigrade feet, fingers, and swiveling wrists that can still be adapted for use as hands. Shapes so generalized, they could easily be adapted to any of the subsequent families which evidently did derive from this basal template. In order to determine their genealogy as accurately as possible, I constructed the following cladogram based on a mitogenomic analysis of caniform relationships. Again, this only accounts for extant animals for which we have DNA, but it gives us a template onto which any fossil caniform should also fit. It's a pretty close match to previous trees based only on morphology, but genetic tests did reveal a couple of surprises. For example, Simocyan, a Miocene allurid, had a pseudothumb, just like its modern cousin. This bony projection from the wrist is a trait which was once thought to have evolved only in pandas, which is why the giant panda and the red panda were classified together. But now it seems this trait has emerged at the base of Arctoidea and was subsequently lost by most descendants, except for a couple of basal ursids like the spectacled bear and the giant panda, which turned out to be an early diverging bear. This trait is also retained, or reinvented, by aelurids, which turned out not to be pandas after all. Instead, they're considered living fossils, retaining some of the most primitive features of the earliest carnivores. If a caniform like Simocyon were to put on some weight and adapt its paws accordingly, it would look like the first bears, especially after losing its tail. If instead it takes to the water, it would look like an otter, then a sea lion, then eventually a seal. The fossil record reveals stages of that transition, too. It could also drop to the ground and trade in dexterous hands for powerful scent glands, becoming a skunk or a weasel. Or if it remains arboreal, it could continue to use its hands as hands and be able to grasp and hold things like the most primitive mammals could. Of course, caniforms account for only one half of the carnivora family tree. In the next video, we'll look at the other fork, known as Theliforms. You've just got to think for a moment. Over millions of years, a dog evolves. Mm -hmm. It's the first dog.